The Unbreakable movies have a weirdly solid track record, which is kind of strange when you consider M. Night Shyamalan and Ding Dong's other works. But I'm shocked to say that I'm genuinely excited for Glass. It's a great duology, and hopefully it'll be a great trilogy. But if you screw this up, M. Night, oh, oh, oh. Oh, you don't want me to find you, M. Night, okay? You don't, you don't, you don't want me to find you, boy. Oh, oh, it ain't gonna be good if I do. Don't screw this up, you bastard! <laughs> you done fucked it up! I can't remember the last time I was this disappointed in a movie. I mean, I'm not sure what I was expecting from the guy who created this. Are you asking me or telling me? May I go to my room, sir? Denied! Sit down! But my god, this hurt to sit through. I really, really wanted to love this movie. I ignored all the bad reviews, I rewatched the first two to get myself excited. If anyone was gonna love this thing, it was gonna be me. And it's a shame because it's not all terrible. It's not badly directed. Actually, there's some cool sequences here and there. The camera moves around a lot, there's some neat shots. It's a fairly well-crafted film, but there's just no style to it. Foundationally, it's well-made, but it's just so visually Boring. Shyamalama Ding Dong is a director who's good at making movies that feel like he made them. He's a director with a distinct style. Unbreakable is a film that knows exactly what tone and style it's going for, and even Split feels like its own thing. You wanna know what this movie style is? Bland. It's a bland, boring superhero movie. Not that it doesn't try to be anything more, at least until the ending, but Oh, we'll get to that. For a good chunk of the runtime, it actually tries to emulate Unbreakable's psychological thriller roots, and I commend it for at least trying to do that. It's relatively small scale, it's quiet, there's a lot of scenes where characters just talk, there's clearly an effort to make the movie seem like a methodical character piece. The problem is that it's really boring. Now some of you are probably going to say, but Jeff. Jeff. Unbreakable is also super boring, and it only has one fight scene, while this one has a few. But somehow you think this is the worst movie? What are you, a hack? Wrong, sir. Wrong. Unbreakable is very slow paced, but it's in no way boring because you actually care about the characters and are constantly wondering where they're gonna end up. Not to mention that one fight is used to signify a massive growth for our protagonist, with class I don't even know who the protagonist is. It suffers from what I call Phantom Menace Syndrome, in that there's too many damn characters and it's never established which one is supposed to be the protagonist. A movie needs at least one character that the audience could get themselves attached to. That's pretty basic storytelling. At first, it seems like the protagonist is gonna be David, but then Kevin and all his personalities end up having a lot of screen time, but then Elijah kinda steals the movie towards the end, but that action is broken up by David's kid and Anya Taylor-Joy, and then you have Sarah Paulson who has a lot of screen time. It all just feels so messy and disjointed, and I can't will myself to be interested in what's going on. It's not impossible to do a movie with an ensemble cast. Infinity War is like 200 characters, and every one of them is given the exact amount of time they're needed. And even then, the movie still has a protagonist, and it's the the bad guy, and he has more of an arc than anyone in Glass, and what little bit of an arc they do have is just plain uninteresting. As for the fights, I'll say that it's kinda cool to see Bruce Willis kicking some ass after all the build up to his potential in the first movie, at least in concept, and execution, it's kinda lame. The fights between David and the Beast don't involve a ton of choreography and mostly involve two really strong dudes trying to strong arm each other, which is fine, that keeps it grounded in some form of reality. The issue comes in the fact that they're shot so terribly. They feel so awkward and unnatural, there's no grace to it in the slightest, and it's so dull visually. Although I'm not sure what I expected from the guy who thought this looked okay. You know, I'm starting to think that me having such high expectations for this movie was my own damn fault. The final fight is probably the best example of this. For some reason, it was shot on an incredibly cloudy day and everything looks so gray and boring. It literally could not have been shot in a more bland way. And it does no favors in trying to hide the movie's small budget. The opening fight also has this weird effect where it looks like they strapped a GoPro to Bruce Willis's crotch and it just straight up looks bad. And it ruins an otherwise cool opening. The whole beginning, in fact, is 
actually kind of cool. You get to see what David's been up to, what he's been doing since 2000, you get some nice moments with Kevin, they bring back the kid from Unbreakable, and he actually does a solid job, and still has great chemistry with Bruce Willis. There's even a solid piece of music at the opening titles. The whole first third, despite some issues, has some solid setup, although when they decided to reference Salt Bay in the year of our Lord 2019, I realized I might not like what was about to come. You know, this movie's actually not too bad so far, right? Judy Actually, my like this. All right, you know, let's see where this goes. Dad, have you ever heard about this guy Salt Bay? Oh, he messed up with his hands in the internet. Oh, oh did they so just? Cool. So they just referenced we'll Salt Bay in, in 2019. Shut up, Dad, you haven't been in a good movie in 10 years. Oh, you haven't been in a movie in 20. Oh, this is gonna Dad, be good, is it? Kid. Do you want to mess with me? Yeah, I do. Oh, you wanna oh go no. Shit? But through all the movie's problems, somehow most of the actors are able to rummage the garbage material and find something to latch onto. James McAvoy, once again, absolutely kills it. He's probably the best part of the movie. The writing isn't as strong here, so he's not as good as he was in Split, but he's still pretty darn good. There are, however, a couple of sequences that really only seem to exist to show off his acting ability, and they get kind of annoying. He plays a bunch of one-note personalities, and the movie almost winks at the audience like, Hey, did you know he's a really good actor? He's really good, you know. Do you get it? His arc is also probably the best one in the movie, and he's able to get in some great character work. Everyone else, though... Ugh... Okay, it's like every time I have something good to say about this movie, I have to immediately backtrack and talk about why it sucks. M, buddy, why you gotta do me like this? Bruce Willis definitely does some of his best work in like a decade. That's not saying much, but it at least feels like he's trying, which is more than I could say for any of his performances in a long time. However, he's not given a chance to shine because the script just doesn't give him anything to work with. And there's a whole chunk of the movie that he's just not in for no discernible reason. He's just gone. And his arc barely even exists to the point where he might as well not even have one. Okay, I'm gonna dive into some spoilers now. If you want to skip them or for some reason you want to watch this movie, just go to whatever the time is on the screen right now. Or don't, just, you know, do whatever you want. Anyway, Sarah Paulson is a psychiatrist who's trying to convince David, Kevin, and Elijah that superpowers aren't real and they're just delusional, which, first off, doesn't make any goddamn sense. There is a scene where Kevin and David, who is a 63-year-old man if we're going by Bruce Willis's actual age, jump out of a window that is at least two stories up and neither one is injured. Not to mention all the stuff we've seen him do in Unbreakable. So how are David and the audience supposed to believe that there is even the smallest chance his powers aren't real? And yes, David does actually buy into this. Even after 19 years of being a superhero, one conversation with a shrink and all of a sudden he's questioning his worldview. Maybe I'd understand it more if he was in a little more of the movie, but again, the movie just forgets he exists for a big chunk of it. His arc is basically him wondering whether or not his powers are real and if he actually is a superhero living among the people. But it's actually a pretty good foundation for an arc, although it sounds a little familiar. I feel like I've heard it before. Oh yeah, Unbreakable! Yes, M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong had so few ideas for how to continue David's story, he literally just repeated his arc from the first movie, except worse. How? Why? I guess there's also something about David's wife dying, but it doesn't go anywhere. It's just mentioned in two sentences and serves no purpose other than we explain why Robert Wright isn't there. So, yeah, we waited 19 years to see David Dunn return to the silver screen, and then they waste him. Of course, there's another character who I've been even more excited to see return, Elijah. Do they at least do him justice? Nope. Because he's not even in the first half of the movie. Yes. In a movie called Glass, Mr. Glass isn't even in half of it. I mean, he kind of is, but he's pretending to be heavily sedated, which apparently is supposed to make us feel bad because we're supposed to think he's being mistreated because we like him? Okay, here's the thing about Elijah. I think he's one of the most sympathetic characters in media. I truly do wish that he had chosen a different path in life. But there's a difference between feeling sorry for someone and excusing their actions, and everyone in this movie seems to forget that he's directly responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people. There's this asshole nurse character who the audience is supposed to hate because he's mean to Elijah, but I'm not sure why. Again. He is a mass murderer. Sarah Paulson is a scene where she's like, we can only help a patient's improve if we treat them with kindness, and I'm like, he killed 27 children and crippled five. But he's treated almost like a martyr by the end. And, oh boy, the end. As terrible as the second third of this movie was, it at least felt like it was building up to something. And, well, it was something, all right. 
So Elijah convinces the beast to help him break out of the psych ward so they could go to some tower and murder a bunch of people to prove superpower people exist. But before they can leave the grounds, David comes out to stop them. By the way, after 19 years of waiting for David and Elijah to face each other again, they never share any lines, except for one scene where Elijah talks to him over an intercom. And in the next scene where they actually are in the same area, they never speak to each other. Do you even know what you're doing? So David and the Beast fight while Elijah keeps shouting a bunch of comic book stuff that is supposed to make him sound like he knows what he's talking about, but it's just the most basic stuff that even a person who is not at all interested in comics would understand without needing it to be spoon-fed to them. David's son, Ani Taylor-Joy, and Elijah's mother also start talking like this, and it does not sound like how any person would talk at all, and it doesn't even make sense sometimes, and it's just annoying. Then the first big Shamalama Ding Dong twist happens. Turns out the train crash that David was in was the same one that killed Kevin's dad. Now I don't know how a casual moviegoer would react to the reveal, but as a big fan of the franchise, it was the most predictable twist ever if you paid any attention to Split, and I hoped they wouldn't do this twist for that very reason. But then they did anyway, because you're just such a clever boy, M. Knight. So anyway, the Beast kills Mr. Glass and almost drowns David, but Anya Taylor-Joy manages to calm him down and bring Kevin to the light. By the way, there's a subplot where Anya Taylor-Joy seems perfectly willing to forgive the person who kidnapped her and literally ate two of her classmates three weeks ago? Why do we even bother with this? It, it just... What am I doing here? But then Kevin gets shot by a guy all of a sudden and it turns out that Sarah Paulson is actually part of a secret society that's been murdering superheroes and villains for thousands of years to try and keep balance or something like that. But they decided to try and rehabilitate David, Kevin, and Elijah instead of just killing them because they feel like being humane this time? Obviously this just raises a ton of unanswered questions. Like, why didn't they get David at any other point in his 19 years of being a superhero? Especially when the movie establishes they knew who he was before capturing him. Or why they kept Elijah in an institution all this time instead of dealing with him at literally any other time. Also, why didn't they just kill them? Sarah Paulson says something about them trying out a new method, but she has no qualms about killing them in the end anyway. Her method just seems way more time-consuming, costly, and ineffective. Oh, and David, our supposed hero who we've been waiting so long to see return, they drown him in a puddle. That's it. He doesn't get to say goodbye to his son, he doesn't get any last words, he doesn't go out like a hero, he doesn't get any closure. They just drown him in a puddle. Because apparently some people think crafting a story that's unsatisfying on every level is considered good filmmaking. Oh, and the fight of the tower never happens either, so that's just Shamalama Ding Dong giving off so many levels of fuck you right there. Anyway, it turns out Elijah hacked a bunch of cameras and livestreamed the whole thing so the footage gets out to the entire world, and I guess people just know superheroes exist now? Except the people more than likely wouldn't take it seriously because nothing on the video is particularly impressive. The beauty of the Unbreakable universe is that the powers all exist within some form of reality. And the issue here is that in this scenario, two strong dudes beating people up doesn't scream superhero. I mean, the Beast can take shotgun shots to the chest to be fine, but that doesn't happen on video, so they just look like some dudes on steroids fighting, not superheroes. Also, the movie implies that you get superpowers if you believe hard enough, and supposedly these videos getting out is supposed to give a bunch of people superpowers. So I guess the message I'm supposed to take away from this is... Believe in yourself? Well, gee, thanks, movie. I'm so glad that this blockbuster was able to teach me the same lessons I can find in the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. But the movie's over now, so you don't have to think about it anymore. Bye. There's honestly a lot more I could get into with Glass. I haven't even talked about how this is the most unsecure psych ward in existence, but I'm just tired and irritated, and I don't care anymore. Class is as poor of an excuse for finale as you can get. It's unsatisfying, the characters are poorly written, it struggles between being a cheap Avengers knockoff and a crappy psychological thriller. It's just bad. And as someone who really, really hoped it would be good, it's painfully bad. 3 out of 10, stay away. I don't know how this could have gone so wrong. I mean, I know it's M. Night Shyamalan and Ding Dong we're talking about, but it felt like he was trying to irritate everyone and just don't know how that works. Unless... Oh no.
Don't you get it, guys? He's trying to destroy us. He's trying to get us to overexert ourselves so hard with irritation that we break down into our most basic components. He's already gotten to Mark Wahlberg. That's why he was such a confused mess in the happening. He had lost all sense of self by this point. Pull black water, keep on rolling. Mississippi moon, won't you keep on shining on me? He writes all his movies like he doesn't understand how people work because he's not human. He's some kind of extraterrestrial monster. We gotta stop him before... Oh no. Ha 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 ha. Now that you have discovered my plans, you must perish, child. Why are you doing this? There are many dark forces at work. Forces your ignorant mind cannot possibly comprehend. Now die. <laughs> Give it up, fool. You cannot best my powers. Wait a minute. What if this is like the movie? I can get superpowers when I'm just believing in myself. Take that, you bastard. I'm the boss around here. Now that I got superpowers, I can... Oh, oh my god, is that a portal to hell? Oh. Oh shit, yeah, that, that's a portal to hell. Uh, I, I, I didn't need to open that. That was, that was a complete accident. Uh, sorry about that. Shyamalan, your crimes against cinema are so heinous, so terrible, you are now sentenced to an eternity of punishment. No, I cannot be stopped. I shall resist. I mean, come on, dude, you don't cry about it. Like, you made the last step, right? I'm not sure what you were expecting. I shall return, Jeff. You know I cannot be contained forever. So long as I exist, I guarantee you will suffer at my hand. I did it. Meet the beast. I hope for your sake that he likes you. Shit, Negro. That's all you had to say. <laughs>